Hey everybody, I'm JJ. You're watching Reality Survival. And today I want to talk about the top 15 ways to prepare for nuclear war. So I'm going to use the live stream for this. Um, we might... Hey everybody, I'm JJ. Uh, it depends on how many people pop in. It's kind of an unscheduled thing. If uh, you guys have got questions about this, then throw them in the chat. I'll address those after I go through all of this stuff. Um, all right, so let me share my screen here. I've got a few stories that I want to share with you guys on, on this topic. Now, as you guys know, um, well, before I get to that, let me talk talk about my Substack real quick. Um, we're going to be doing a giveaway of um, we're doing kind of doing a hundred thousand subscriber giveaway um, on Substack. So you go to realitysurvival.substack.com. You can sign in free as a free subscriber, or you can get in on the paid uh, subscriber membership. And on the paid subscriber membership, I'm running a special right now, so it's only like I don't know forty bucks a year or something like that. And you get in on the monthly giveaways. I've only got 65 paid subscribers right now total. So your chances are basically one in 65 uh, each month. Um, the giveaway pack for the paid subscribers, uh, this this next one here for the 100,000 subscriber giveaway is going to be um, a uh, little power bank, a 26,000 milliamp hour power bank. We've got uh, a little mag carrier from extracarry.com. Carry a, a magazine discreetly in your pocket. Those are pretty cool. And then we've got a Leatherman OHT. Um, that's the, uh, the kind that slide out from the end, sort of like the Gerber ones, but it's Leatherman. It's kind of cool. And then a Kershaw grid, uh, everyday carry knife, and then an atomic bear tactical pin. So that's for the paid subscriber side on the um, free subscriber side. We got another uh, um, extracarry.com magazine holder. And we've got a Streamlight ProTac flashlight. And uh, another uh, tactical pin from Tom Bear. And then another one of these Kershaw grid knives so go over to reality survival.substack.com put in your email address and get in for those giveaways right it's pretty easy to do all that does is it just allows me to have your email address so that i can email you the videos whenever i have them and i usually do like a weekly roundup or something i don't even really send out that many that many videos okay um i also want to take a second and talk to you guys about emp shield the topic of this video is going to be related to this in, in, a, in a certain way so I figured we might as well talk about it. EMP Shield is a device that will protect your home or your vehicles, your ATVs, your tractors, your solar panels, your radio systems, all, all different kinds of things um, from an electromagnetic pulse if there were a high altitude nuclear detonation or a coronal mass ejection or even a lower nuclear detonation that was in closer proximity to you. Now, I think that the most important one to have is your vehicles because most people work away from their homes and it's an estimated it's like 60 to 70 percent of vehicles could be negatively affected during an EMP. So to me, these devices are so easy to install. I just think it makes sense to put them on there. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a real quick rundown here. You got basically three different wires, red, black and green. You hook the red wire to your positive terminal, or your battery. You hook the, the black wire to the negative terminal of your battery and the green wire to a chassis ground. It's that easy. Comes with some really heavy duty industrial um, like hook and loop type tape from 3M. So you, you literally don't even have to drill any screws or anything like that. You can just clean off a, a, a good area that, you know, it would stick well. Stick that thing to that uh, surface and hook those three wires up and you got coverage. I mean... It's a pretty easy way to make sure that you can get home to your family. And that's what I like about it. Um, use the discount code Reality Survival, and it will save you $50 at checkout. And here's a little tip. If you can search around and find um, other like discount codes, they'll take two of them sometimes. 
So I don't know for sure uh, what any other codes are, but you can check that out and they will let you take two sometimes. So that's kind of cool. Okay, enough of paying the bills. Now let's talk about these news stories. So, so this comes um, to us from uh, BBC News, Dmitry Muratov. And uh, he is apparently a Nobel winning journalist that uh, the Russian authorities have shut down his newspaper. And he is very concerned about Russia using nukes. And there's a particular quote in here that I thought was really interesting. It's a little bit of an insight into Russian society that I thought you guys might want to know about. And it says, we see how state propaganda is preparing people to think that nuclear war isn't a bad thing. He says, on TV channels here, nuclear war and nuclear weapons are promoted as if they're advertising pet food. So that tells me that the Russian propaganda machine is in full bore and everybody's propaganda machine is probably in full bore right now, right? I, I acknowledge that. But, but the point is, is that it's possible that Russia is softening their society, their, their civilian populace, to the idea that this could be happening, right? And here is another story that, that dovetails onto that. Um, this is from Newsweek, and it says, Russian billboards instruct citizens how to prepare nuclear survival kits, okay? Um, Russian authorities have put up digital billboards in Moscow that instruct citizens on how to prepare a nuclear survival kit in case of an attack, according to local media reports. So we've heard about them doing this in the past. It's not like it's the first time it's happened, but it does just kind of reinforce the previous story that they are trying to soften their citizens up to the idea that nukes could be could be exchanged. Now, as you guys know, I don't think that that's a huge, huge high, you know, possibility. And I still don't think it's really, really high. I do think it's considerably higher than it used to be, though. And we, we're definitely inching upward on that on that scale. OK. Um, and, and I started and I'll talk a little bit later about some of the things that I've started to do to prepare for this myself, because we should probably take it seriously. OK, um, next thing is this was an article from the Brunswick News. Kim Jong-un uh, threatens nuclear use anytime as nuclear carrier arrives in South Korea. OK, so take a look at that picture of that guy right there. Does he look stable to you? <laughs> he doesn't look very stable to me. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they've developed um a nuclear submarine now at this point it doesn't have a very long range it's not like it's going to pop up off of our coast and you know be able to to you know throw out a nuke or something like that it, it's not capable of going that far but point is is they are making some advances in this area and their leader is not necessarily the most stable individual so you know there's that Last one, last story here, and then we'll get into the 15 tips. Uh, Putin ally says Russia has weapons to destroy the U.S. if it ex its existence is threatened. And then another one below here was titled a little differently. Russia has unique modern weapons capable of destroying any enemy. Now, the the this, this word use of the word unique weapons is something that's interesting. And I think what they're referring to or or they're acting like they're referring to whether or not there, there is actually any there there. It's hard to say, um, but I believe that they're trying to indicate that they have weapons beyond nukes, right? Now, is that a possibility? Of course, it's a possibility because the START Treaty inspections only cover nuclear weapons, right? That's all unclassified out in open information. That's what the START Treaty is. It's it's very well known. They inspect us, we inspect them. But what those things don't include is any other weapons that are not a part of that treaty. So just like the United States could have developed other weapons um, and probably has developed other weapons, Russia also could have as well. So I think that it makes it makes sense at this point in time and maybe before this point in time, um, but it, it makes sense to start doing some things to prepare for the possibility 
Now, again, I want to stress to you guys that I'm not just because I'm I'm talking about this does not mean that I think that um, it's a really really high probability or you know like hey it's it's going to happen anytime now or you know something like that. That's that's just not the case. Okay, um, I don't really think that. I do think it's pretty low, but I think make doing some common sense things to prepare makes sense if you can. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, number one is get your basement ready to act as a makeshift bunker. Now, you got to remember, I've talked to you guys about this multiple times. If you haven't seen these videos, you got to go watch my nuclear survival skills playlist. There's probably 10 or 15 videos in there, and um, that will help you understand the concepts of time, distance, and shielding. You need to use all three. Hang on just a second. Let me uh, text my wife here about the dogs. Um, okay, so time, distance, and shielding. That is really, really important. Okay. The when you're creating a bunker in your basement or whatever, if you're gonna have it, that's where you're going to shelter, you want to try to get as much mass as between you and anywhere where fallout could pile up outside. All right. So, like one of the things that I've done in, in my house is uh I've built I have built um, uh, shelves along all the outer walls, and I'm using the shelves as storage space just because I need storage space, right? But that also enables me to put stuff up there that that has a lot more, it has more mass. Um, and if a situation were to kick off, I have two pallets of wood pellets that. That's, you know, that's, uh, I guess that would be a uh, hundred bags and I can take and I can pile those up on the top sh layers of those shelves close to where the ground level is in our basement to help provide additional blocking from those photons coming in from the fallout. All right. Um, so you, every basement is different and you're going to have to just kind of take a look at, at what your situation is and, and what you're going to do. Now, I know some of you guys are screaming right now and typing into the keyboard, but I don't have a basement. OK, um, I don't I'm sorry about that. Uh, that sucks. You still have time, right? You can still do lots of things. You could look at buying a potential storm shelter. Um, I've seen pre-made concrete store, storm shelters that go for like. Four grand, I think um, that you could have one put in your backyard or something like that. Uh, as an alternative, you if you live in a high rise, if you want to get into the center, um, like the center level of the building at the in the center part of the of from the exterior aspects of it. Again, I've got videos explaining all this in more detail, so check that out. Then you can you can do that, right? Problem is, is that most high rises are closer to populated areas. You probably want to avoid populated areas because they're more likely to be a potential target. Um, if you live in the suburbs, but you don't have a basement, you're not going to be able to get a storm shelter. There's no, you know, big industrial buildings or whatever nearby that you can take shelter in. I would recommend taking a look at potential um, like old town halls, um, churches, places, other big buildings that have a basement. If you're not a member of a church, find a church with a good basement or, or a building that would work as, you know, to, to shelter you and uh, become a member. Um, find some friends. If you have friends that have a basement, maybe you could do that. Uh, the, the thing is, is that sheltering inside of a house without a basement is really not a great option. Um, it does not provide a good level of protection unless you have, unless you've done some significant modifications and put up a lot of stuff around the exterior of your house. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's just not a, a real great option. So you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do. Make a plan now, though. That way you can execute the plan if something did happen. Um, okay. Uh, number two is have enough water stored in your home to be able to shelter in place for a minimum of two weeks. Sealed containers, right? We talked about this in previous videos. As long as they're sealed containers, you can drink the water. Even if it has photons passed through it, 
It's not going to do anything. It's not going to harm you to be able to drink it. The thing is, is you want to make sure that they're inside and they're protected from dust. If let's say that was stored, that water was stored outside or somewhere where it could get fallout dust on it. And then you put your lips on it and you get fallout dust inside, you know, inside your body, that's bad. You don't want that. But as long as the water's sealed up, you clean off the top of the container or whatever. And then when you drink it, you know, you're not getting any, any fallout. You're fine. That will work. Um, but you got to think long term as well, right? If, God forbid, uh, we have a, a limited nuclear strike here on the U.S. and, you know, one or five or ten bombs go off or something along those lines, that's going to cause a lot of chaos. And the, the, the possibility of um, you, the power grid and utilities going down and all that kind of stuff in, in our mix with that chaos uh, is pretty high, right? And preceding a nuclear attack, we would, it is likely that we could see potential cyber attacks that could attack the grid. Um, some people have said that it could be possible that an EMP would be detonated first. I don't really think that's a, that's a viable option personally. I've talked about that in other videos as well. Um, but point is utilities could be affected and your water supply might not be very stable. So what are you going to do for collecting water from outside sources, groundwater, lakes, streams, ponds, things like that? When you get that water, do you know how to filter it? Again, check the video I did on filtering water in a nuclear environment um, from improvised sources. The other thing that you can do is you can get a seven stage reverse osmosis water filter from newaquasystems.com. And that is the most effective option for removing radionuclides um, for an inside the house water filter that I'm aware of. I'm going to have a video coming out here real quick, real shortly, showing you how I set mine up in my basement so that I can use the, the water filter normally, just, you know, normal times just to get drinking water right from a tap on my faucet. But then I also have a set of uh, valves set up where I can turn that water off to the faucet upstairs and I have a secondary faucet downstairs. I can take the, the gallons of water, you know, or uh, buckets of water and barrels, I guess they're 15 gallon barrels of uh, water. And I can, I can move it over to the filter. I can put the inlet hose in there and I can drink filtered water from there. So like if I have to, once all my water in my basement is gone, I have to go outside and get water and bring it in. I bring it in after I've pre-filtered it um, with the clay filter and, and that kind of thing. Like, like I talked about in that other video, and I'm going to bring it in. I'm going to do one last filtering with it. And that's going to be with the seven stage filter because I just want to make sure that I'm not ingesting any of those radionuclides. Um, reverse osmosis filters are the best way to go about that. And um, I think it makes sense to have something like that in your basement to be ready to be able to deal with because any, any fallout or anything like that. And, and the, the thing is, is that like once you prepare your basement and if if something was like that was to happen, uh, you don't just have to, to shelter once. I mean, you might only have to shelter once, but you could have to shelter multiple times, not because of multiple bombs, but because of shifting wind patterns. So let's say that you're on the outskirts of an area um, that was targeted and, you know, maybe you're 30 or 40 miles away. You didn't receive any damage from the blast itself. Maybe you had some initial fallout that happened. You wait two weeks, you know, and, and you, you go back to to s slowly start to getting back to business. Well, it won't be business as normal, but, you know, carrying on and doing the things you have to do. But then the wind shifts and you get additional fallout that comes later. Then you have to go back in and shelter again. You know, this could happen multiple times. So you want to have your shelter ready to go. So that's why I thought it made sense for me to, to put the water filter down in the basement because I may have to end up using it multiple times. Now, again, I can always just turn it back on and use it if I want. So anyway, I'll have a video showing that whole setup for you before too long. You can go to newaquasystems.com, use the discount code Reality Survival, and until May 30th, 2023, that'll save you $50 off that unit. That's the highest discount they've done for anybody 
ever on those systems. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty good discount. I mean, I think that I don't remember for sure, but I think that takes it down to around like 250 for the whole system. Um, after the 30th, it'll go to 10%. The disc, the coupon code will revert to 10%. So, um, check that out. If you guys haven't thought about what you're going to do for long-term water filter, um, filtering in your house, I think this is, I think that makes a good option. Okay. Number three, uh, have some MREs or other food that doesn't really need to be cooked down in your basement area already ready to go. To me, MREs are the best way to go because one, they have plenty of nutrition, calories and all that kind of stuff. Two, um, you don't poop very often when you eat them. <laughs> and you, you, we're going to have to talk about sanitation and stuff like that here in a second. You, you don't really want to be eating foods um, that you're not used to eating and, and or that run through you quickly when you're having to shelter in the basement and you might not have access to your normal uh, sanitation facilities and all that kind of thing. So I think MREs make, make pretty good sense um, for sheltering. Um, and what was the name of the company? Oh, dang it. There was just a company that had them on sale. And it was only like $40 for a case. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, wait. Let's see. Here it is. Uh, come on, come on, come on. Oh, yeah. And I can't see that. I can't see it on the thing. It's like it's an army surplus store that I get notifications from all the time. I'm trying to find it in my email here. I'll have to see if I can find it later. Army signal search. I can't find it. I will put a link down in the description below for you guys. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, MREs are good. And and $49, I thought that was a pretty good deal because they're pretty expensive nowadays. Um, okay, so number four, think about sanitation. How are you going to deal with the poo? Now, um, perhaps if you are on a well and a septic and... You have water in the house where you can, you know, pour the bucket of water down your toilet to get it to flush. If you've got a, a toilet in your basement, good on you. That's great. That's going to be the best way to go because then you can just stay in the basement and you can do your business and you got no issues, right? A lot of basements in a lot of places, you, you, you'll you see that they don't have uh, toilets and stuff because they have to pump the water up to get to the to the septic system. Now, some of them will have a, a pump that'll do that, but a lot of them don't. So then you might have to be looking at like a composting toilet or a luggable loo or something like that, you know, a bucket and, and, and put some gel packs in there, you know, and then tie it up in bags and, you know, put it over in a corner or somewhere or whatever. Could you run upstairs if you had a, you didn't, you had a, a well and a septic but you didn't have one downstairs. Could you run upstairs, use the bathroom real quick and run back down? Yeah, probably. Especially if it's like several days into it. Um, if you just made it quick, you know, wait until you really had to go run upstairs, do your business and then run back downstairs. The time you're not getting very much exposure on that. Right. So it, you probably would be fine if you were several days into the sheltering situation because of the way that the fallout runs down really quickly. Again, see that video, that playlist, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, now, if you have city water, is it going to still work? Is your tank going to still work? Is your is your toilet going to still flush? Maybe. It just all depends. Um, was the water towers and stuff like that in your district, were they affected when the nuke went off, if one went off close to you? You know, the thing is, 80% of people in a limited strike kind of situation aren't going to be anywhere near where the nuke went off. 
So you might not even have to shelter at all if that was the case, right? Um, but those people who are close to it, there could be some infrastructure damage. And so city water might not be working and the power grid in that area could be knocked down there. Therefore, um, any of the sewage pumps and stuff might not, might not be working. So you might have problems. So just I just want you to think about how are you going to deal with poo if you have to. You definitely don't want to go outside, especially in the first two weeks, if you don't have to. OK, you want to definitely try to avoid doing that to reduce your exposure to the radiation. Um, so you got to think about how you're going to do it, how you're going to deal with it inside. All right. Um, number five, medical kits. Uh, the likelihood of injury, if you're in a highly populated area where a strike occurred, there's going to be a lot of injuries that are cuts, lacerations, burns, flying debris, you know, trauma kind of in injuries, different things like that, right? Because it's a, a nuclear detonation is a very violent event. And if you happen to be on the borders of one of those areas where you weren't let's say that you weren't incinerated immediately. Okay. Uh, obviously if that happens, you don't have to worry about anything else, but if you were on that border zone, you know, say maybe five to 10 kilometers out, depending on the size of the device and all that kind of stuff, there's going to be lots of broken windows, lots of broken glass, lots of, you know, flying stuff uh, in the air and stuff. When it happens, you could receive some injuries. So you need to have a good first aid kit, a good trauma kit and all that kind of stuff to be able to, to deal with those injuries. Um, Refuge Medical is the company that I deal with the most. You guys have, who watch me often have seen that. Um, the thing, one of the things that they have that is super critical is a wound care bucket, okay? This, this bucket is filled with gauze, and tape and all the kind of stuff that you need to deal with long-term uh, injuries of major, you know, major injuries. It's made to be able to treat a gunshot wound for 30 days, I think, is kind of what they um, advertise. Head over to refugemedical.com, take a look at that stuff, sign up for it, get get you one, use the discount code Reality Survival to save 10% there. They have the best kits on the market, in my opinion. I'm going to be showing you their uh, field medic pack here pretty soon. And it's, it's, it's awesome. It's really good. Um, so think about injuries. Um, and this, this is also think about injuries in your vehicle as well. Um, having a vehicle first aid kit is just as important. You got all that glass surrounding you in your car and all that kind of stuff and, and glass from other vehicles and, and debris and all that kind of thing. So even if you're just if you're having to try to get home, you may have to deal with some sort of injuries or something like that, cuts on you and stuff. So make sure you got that taken care of. Okay, number six, self-defense. Um, firearms, ammo, plate carrier, soft vests, pepper spray, whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, here's the thing. Some people might not be smart enough to know that they need to shelter after something like that. And they might decide to go out and start looting. Okay. And so depending on what your proximity is to the stupid people, um, then you need to be ready to deal with that. Because here's the thing, radiation isn't visible. You don't, you don't know it. You don't know what it is. Like a lot of people, if they're not educated on this stuff, they could look outside and maybe they see that, you know, it's dusty and it's, it's a little smoky or whatever the case may be, but they don't. There's no real reason why they can't go out and get some, you know, Nikes or, or whatever. <laughs> um, and there will probably be a, a large number of people that do that. And that's not going to work out well for them in the long run. But in the short run, they might last a few days, you know, before they start getting really sick. And that can cause a lot of damage in that time frame. And so you need to be ready to prepare to defend your house, your family, and all those kinds of things. Um, to me, and here's the thing on, on body armor, whatever you get, it's fine. You know, it's up to you. Um, but the way I see it is, is if I'm going, if I know that I'm going to have to be using a, a, a weapon, I would like to have a vest of one, some kind or another to help protect me because bullets go both ways, right? And so it just makes sense to make sure that you have a vest. 
Whether, like I said, if you want to go with the soft vest, that's fine. That's that's a lot more concealable and you can use that in a lot of different situations or go with a set of hard plates. Um, personally, especially if you're older and you got back problems or if you're not in great shape, go with a set of poly plates because they'll weigh one to two pounds each as opposed to like, you know, eight to 10 or whatever for steel or ceramic. Um, okay. Number seven is personal protective equipment. And this is not, you don't have to wear this while you're in your shelter, right? It's only going to have to be worn if you go outside or if you have like a lot of leaks in your house, or if you have like a ton of broken out windows that you can't seal up and you've got, you know, fallout just coming and going in your house or something, then, then obviously you'd want to have that gas mask on. But as long as your house is, is intact and it's sealed up, with just the normal doors and windows, um, then you're not going to have to wear a gas mask inside unless you were like really close to the proximity of the detonation where it was extremely, you know, there was tons of debris in the air and it was like, and it was filtering into your house or something. Okay. But if you're 15, 20 kilometers away from where the detonation site was, or, or maybe more depending on the size of the device, you're probably not going to have to have anything on when you're in your house. Okay. Um, but if you go outside during that first two weeks after that fallout, you really should have a gas mask on. Um, probably also wear like gloves and a poncho or some type of an overcoat, like, you know, big rubber boots, duct tape your cuffs up, you know, try to keep out as much uh, dust or dirt debris as you can. You're really worried about the alpha and beta uh, particles at that point, just getting on your skin and burning you. So you just want to stay covered up for the most part. Okay. Um, Mira Safety makes the best gas masks for civilian use that I'm aware of. They um, they really they really make a good a good product. Um, I am an affiliate with them. You can see the affiliate link down below. I don't have a discount code for you, unfortunately, but um, they're they're good masks. Okay, number eight. Um, right this time of year, it's not going to be so important. But later on, because there's no guarantee anything's going to happen anytime soon, um, you need to think about heat. Right? How are you going to uh, heat the space that you're in if it's the winter time? Um, maybe you don't have to, depending on where you live. If you're far enough south or whatever, you might not have to worry about it. Uh, one recommendation would be. If you are going to run an indoor rated propane tank uh, as, you know, our propane heater as your heat device, make sure that you get a battery operated carbon monoxide detector just to make sure that you don't end up killing, accidentally killing yourself and your family. Um, because if that carbon monoxide poisoning in a basement, it kind of starts piling up and then the level starts to rise and rise. And if you're sleeping on a cot or whatever, and then at a certain point you just, you know, pass out from, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning or whatever, and that, that wouldn't be good. Um, I mean, you're probably going to get a bad headache and start realizing something's going on before then, but even if you were sleeping or something, you might not. So um, obviously for warmth, you could have just multiple blankets, sleeping bags, you know, winter clothes, all that kind of stuff that, that might be the best option and not have um, an active heat source. Maybe uh, just think about what's going to be best for your situation. Number nine, firefighting equipment. Uh, 10 pound ABC fire extinguishers, fire blankets, gas masks, emergency smoke escape hoods. The likelihood of fire existing in highly populated areas is very high. Um, something that you need to think about is where is your backup shelter if your house catches on fire and is burned to the point that you can't stay there anymore? Do you have your bug out bags ready to go? Um, where are you going to move to? That is what's your alternates. You know, you got to think in the terms of pace. We've talked about this probably hundreds of times on this channel. Primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. Where are you going to go? Okay, your primary is your house. Where's your backup? Where's the backup to the backup? And where's the emergency that you really got nowhere else to go? Where are you going to go? You got to think about those things. Um, I recommend having... Uh, multiple 10 pound fire extinguishers in your homes at all times. I probably got six or eight um, here in my house. 
Um, one thing I do is I always make sure and keep that fire extinguisher, at least one of them, in my bedroom next to my bed so that if I have to get up and, and there's a fire already outside my bedroom door, and, and you should always sleep with your doors closed, by the way, if you know if you don't know that. That is a better, way better option in case your house catches on fire. It slows the spread of the fire considerably. Um, but if I have to get out and go to my child's room to get them, I need something to be able to fight it, fight the fire, right? To try to at least douse it down so I can get through. That's where having a uh, fire blanket, smoke escape hood, and a, a large fire extinguisher is going to come in handy. Um, if you have a fire extinguisher, but it's downstairs in the kitchen or in your garage or whatever, it ain't going to help you any. Um, so think about your placement of where you're putting the fire uh, extinguishers and, and that kind of thing. Okay. Number 10, pack a Faraday cage with uh, good items that you would want to protect uh, from an EMP. So like I said earlier, if they are, even if there was a lower altitude nuclear detonation, uh, let's say it was set just at the height. Uh, to do optimum infrastructure damage, you know, somewhat above the ground, but not really, really high, um, then you're still going to get an EMP from that all the way out to the line of sight from where that detonation is, right? So you might want to protect some things. Maybe you want to put in a shortwave multiband radio. That would be a really good thing to do. That way you can gather intelligence and see what's going on afterwards. Walkie talkies so you can have inner team com you know, communications. If somebody has to go outside and deal with a security threat, they can talk to people inside to let them know what's going on. Um, red dot for rifles, night vision, thermal devices, flashlights, multimeters might be a good one too for working on stuff afterwards. Um, whatever other electronics you think is important, you know, stick them in that Faraday cage. I've got a couple of videos that talk about how to. Uh, make Faraday cages. Okay, um, number 12, install an EMP shield on your vehicle so that you can get home if there were a detonation. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. Traffic's going to be everywhere, but you want to have the best chances possible. And to me, having a vehicle is way better than trying to get, hoof it on foot, especially if there's radiation somewhere, because you're going to be able to get home faster, even if you're having to deal with traffic and stuff. All right. Um, Again, there's that discount code reality survival at empshield.com. Um, also, have a generator with spare fuel and install a whole house EMP shield. All right. Now, probably the best option, and that's kind of 11, 12, and 13 here all in one. Uh, probably the best option is to have a, sm a small solar array with a solar generator because. You're going to be able to get power from that, but it's a little bit more discreet. You could set them panels out, you know, somewhere in the yard where they can get good south facing sun, but maybe they won't notice a whole lot of attention. And uh, and there's not going to be probably tons of people roaming around. Right. But um, because most people aren't going to be stupid enough to be looting, but you never know. But you could have the, the solar panels outside. You can run the, the, the input cable into the solar generator down in the basement with you where you could be using it. Right. So that's going to give you a pretty good source of power down there um, in your shelter or whatever that you could use on a reoccurring basis. So that could be a good option for you. I mean, one of those like uh, EcoFlow Deltas or the Blue Yeti or any of those, especially the ones where you've got like, um, you know, the, the 3000 watt hour batteries, that's going to be plenty of power for you just you know for a couple weeks situation stuck in the basement kind of thing just sheltering it out riding it out uh let's see here yeah because oh and the, yeah the other thing is is that the the solar arrays or the solar generators they don't push out exhaust i don't remember if i said that or not but they're not going to be pushing out a bunch of exhaust so it's not going to be loud number one but number two it's not going to be kicking up that fallout dust in the area and stirring it back up in the air and everything so um that's kind of the, one of the downsides to a, a regular generator where you know that's sitting outside your house you really don't want the air to be disturbed and all that kind of stuff if you can help it okay number 14 is think about how well fed or how are you going to feed and take care of your animals? If you have any, if you live, you know, if you have pets or whatever the case may be, are you going to bring them inside? 
Um, how, if you do bring them inside, how are you going to deal with their poo? Um, some people's pets are like their animal or some people's pets are like their family members and they will, you know, leaving them outside is not an option, right? Totally respect that. Just think about, um, how are you going to deal with the the poo situation right if it's a dog maybe you can start training them now to go on like a potty pad or um you know a little green fake you know astroturf or you know something along those lines right you can start working on training them if they are like goats or rabbits or chickens or other like small livestock like ducks <laughs> or something you're probably not training them so you're gonna have a heck of a mess to deal with if you bring them inside and I'm not judging, you know, if you do, um, but you're gonna have to figure that out now. And unfortunately, the the kind of bad side about this is, is if you leave them outside or whatever, then uh, they're not going to be able to be used for food production after that, if they're exposed to nuclear fallout radiation, right? So probably in terms of like chicken, ducks, geese, goats, things like that, Things that could potentially be protein sources, you might, um, you know, you might need to, to butcher them. I don't know that you'd have enough time to be able to do that. I suppose that you could, you know, uh, slaughter them outside, cut them really quick, bring them inside and process the rest of it inside. Um, I'm just trying to think of alternatives here. I'm not saying it's a good option necessarily, um, but that way it wouldn't go to waste thing is is you probably got more important things to deal with right you, you got if you're going to have to get you and your family and all your stuff down into the shelter and all that you know you're not going to have a, a whole lot of time here you know you know to be able to do something like that so i don't know that that's very realistic it's it's a tough decision all i'm saying is is that you need to think about what you're going to do with them okay and number 15 is uh, entertainment two weeks doesn't sound like a very long time when we're going about our daily lives, dealing with work and, and, and hobbies and, and all those other things. Two weeks flies by sometimes. Uh, trust me, when you don't know what's going on in the world around you and you're sitting there not doing anything for two weeks, you're going to go, you're going to go crazy. You're going to, your mind is going to go all over the place. You need to have something to occupy your mind. Um, books, games, DVDs, VCR tapes, drawing pads, um, hacky sack. Um, I don't know. You gotta, you gotta have something, you gotta have something to do. So think about entertainment and how you're going to do that. Okay. Next, next, my next thing I have is a question for you guys. Then I'll go to the, to the chat and see if anybody's got any questions pertaining to this subject. And then we'll, we'll talk about those. Is anybody out there aware of a solar powered wireless security camera system that does not use internet an ip address so my point is i would like to find see i have the, i have like the ring cameras now and that's great when the internet's up they work really good no problems with them whatsoever um and then i have a, an alarm on the house too but but for for surveillance to be able to see outside my house Internet's probably not going to be up after some sort of a detonation, right? So I would love to be able to find a system that is solar powered so that the cameras mount on the outside of the house with a solar panel and um, and then they transmit via their own Wi-Fi signal to the to the base unit that does not require the use of internet to record it. <laughs> I don't know if it exists. Um, and I don't mind if the base unit takes like the DVR part of it or whatever takes power to, to run it. Cause I can plug that into my solar generator, but I'm trying to find stuff. And I was looking the other day on Amazon and everything. And I, I didn't find anything that really seemed like it really fit the bill. Well, um, there were a couple that were close, but I just thought I would throw it out to you guys, see if we can collectively figure this out as a group, um and find out what the best option out there might be because um it would be a great option i think to have some sort of you know surveillance system in your basement so that you could see what's going on outside 
that's what I'm getting to. And I don't have a great solution for it yet. So I'm hoping that maybe you guys can help me find one. Okay. Great question. The lamb is the light. Is plastic tape on all the windows going to help? No. I get this question all the time. And um, that the only reason that like the, the FEMA website and ready.gov and everything like that talk about having plastic and sealing up your windows and your doors is in case with it's it's with the assumption that there's blo broken glass at your house. Okay. If you have broken glass at your house and broken windows or whatever, then yes, you need to seal them up with plastic. All the plastic does is keeps the dust from blowing indoors. It does not stop ionizing radiation or gamma radiation at all. You have to have time, distance, and shielding to do that. Primarily a lot of mass, okay? So I, I don't know why they wrote that article up on ready.gov the way that they did, but they didn't explain anything. And um, that's... That's what it is, <laughs> but th that has caused so many questions. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I'm going to go back and review here. Um, see what we got. No. Okay. So that's a good question. Um, yep. That's me says if missiles are intercepted in the air, which a lot of them would be, if not all, um, would there be fallout or residual radiation? So no, not really. Not to any significant level. If it if it if a nuclear missile goes what they call low order, and it doesn't have a uh, higher high order detonation, there there will be some fallout from it, from just the uranium and and it, that it got broken into big chunks or whatever the case may be. But it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be to the level of the kind of fallout that you would see if the if the nuke if the nuke detonated totally. Um, so a, a slight amount, but almost negligible. I mean, it, it would, it, it wouldn't be much. It wouldn't be anything that you'd really have to be concerned with unless like the debris like fell on your house, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Um, Utah Mike says, if you could delay those attacks for five years and let me <laughs> work out my retirement. That's funny. Um, no, that's another good question, Utah Mike. If, if nuclear missiles are intercepted, does that create an EMP? No, it does not. Again, there's a certain, and, and you can't really go into too much about the design and all that kind of stuff, but I'll, I'll just say that there, there is a particular order of events that has to happen in order for a nuclear missile to, to be detonated where it gives its full yield and, and is a thermal nuclear device, right? If those events don't happen exactly as they're supposed to in the correct order they're supposed to, it doesn't go off. The, 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 re, the nuclear reaction doesn't happen. So that's what I was saying earlier. You might have a little bit of fallout or not, not really fallout, but you might have a little bit of uh, radioactive contamination from the breakup of the of the uranium and the plutonium and the, the parts that are in it. But that isn't, yeah, I mean, it's like it's like less than a thousandth of the scale that we're talking about if it actually goes high order, right? It's it's orders of magnitude less. Um, so, and then the same thing with it, does it create an EMP? No, it will not create an EMP. Um, it, it's a low order detonation. So it's not going to have all that ionizing radiation that's going to interact with the ionosphere to create the, the electromagnetic pulse. Um, okay. <laughs> Peter Rouse said, move to New Zealand. Problem solved. Yeah, you can do that. Um, yeah, Utah Mike, good suggestion. If you don't have a basement, look into tornado shelters. There could be potential government funds for that. That's a possibility. And you also might have some old ones left over, old fallout shelters from the 60s. I know in a lot of towns in like Western Nebraska and stuff like that, there were a ton of old old buildings with shelter signs still on them. Um, I don't think that those shelters, they're probably filled up with like file cabinets and old chairs and stuff like that. Um, but they're out there. 
So if you go scouting around and you start looking intentionally for those signs in those old shelters, you might be able to find some. Uh, Chuck Norris Gun Club says, worst case scenario, jump into a river and go underwater. That's not good advice. <laughs> it's not going to help you any. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, let's see. Rick Havoc says he's going to the roof to watch the sunrise. Come on, man. Don't be a coward. You can do this. It ain't that big a deal. All right. Yeah, poly plates are multi-hit. That's right, Cron. Uh, they're good. They're good plates. They're they're expensive, but man, they're good. They're good plates. Uh, all right. Almost caught up. If you guys got any questions, go ahead and get them in there now. And I'll finish them up as soon as I finish reading here. Otherwise, I'm going to cut this off. <laughs> Utah Mike says, two weeks in the basement. Will the wife be down there also? I don't know. I guess it depends on if she can get home from work or not, right? I mean, maybe you don't want to put an EMP shield on her car, right? <laughs> That's terrible, man. Come on. <laughs> All right. Okay, I answered the question about the plastic. Um, so what type of radio do I recommend? Nanny D says, what type of radio do you recommend? This would be only to listen for updates. Um, I personally, what I bought was the CC Crane. Hold on. I'll... I'll just pull it up for you real quick if I can find it. Oops, where's let me see here. I bought the it's called the oh, I'll just um oop, it's currently unavailable on from this seller. I got the C the CC Crane Skywave single side band. It has single sideband, AM, FM, shortwave, NOAA, um, VHS aviation band, uh, all in one little radio. And it, it's kind of expensive. It was like, I don't know, I think it was like a couple hundred dollars. Um, I'll, I'll just put the link in the chat for what for what I bought. Like I said, it's you might have to find it from a different vendor because the... the um, link that I bought it at is not live anymore. So there that is for you in the chat. Um, yeah, I, Harry, I, he said um, in an older house, it's drafty plastic would be a good idea when no broken or not. I don't, I don't really think it's the case. Now, if you if you normally because see that the fallout from a nuclear bomb is primarily going to be it's going to be the the bigger the stuff that you're really going to be worried about is going to be the bigger stuff that's coming down fairly quick after the detonation and that has a lot more radioactivity to it and it's also heavier particles so it's it's not going to be so much of the the, the fine dust and stuff um but I, I think it's going to be that 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 bigger, heavier, grittier kind of of stuff that's that's putting off a lot. Because the reason is is that the the fine stuff is going to stay airborne a lot longer, and and it burns out quicker. Right? There's only so many photons able to be in that in that, and and it's going to burn out quicker than something that's bigger with that has a lot more radiated particles. Those finer pieces are going to stay in the air longer and, and they might stay up there for weeks and, and not be any danger to anybody. And, you know, it's the stuff that comes down right away that's bigger and stuff that you got to worry about. So in my opinion, I don't think that you would need to, you know, seal up a house unless it was really like, like really, like really old house, you know, <laughs> like really bad, really bad and drafty. Um, but 
most houses that most people live in, for the most part, I don't, you know, constructed from 1950s until now, you're probably not going to have to worry about it. If your house is constructed prior to 1950 or something, and, you know, maybe it makes sense. I don't know. I, I just have to see what you're living in. But um, the main thing to get across in that, whether or not you decide to, to tape it up or not, it doesn't matter. The main thing to understand is, is that plastic isn't giving you any protection from anything except for the dust coming in your house. All that fallout that's laying outside of your house is still irradiating you through the plastic and through the walls of your house. That's why you have to have a whole bunch of mass built up between you and it. So uh, there you go. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Can you explain if there's any protection additionally you may need for neutron bomb? Great show, by the way. So my understanding is, is that there is not a lot that you need to do differently with um a neutron bomb it's and, and i'm not an expert in in this and there's not actually as much information about neutron bombs out there as there is about thermonuclear devices but my understanding if i'm if i'm getting it right a neutron bomb has a higher degree of radiation but less fireball and less like infrastructure damage. And the, the reason for the development of those initially was that the idea was that they could detonate them over like military targets and the, the higher radiation dose, doses would kill the military personnel, but leave the equipment intact. I don't, my understanding is, is that most militaries have shifted away from that using that idea um, entirely because it's it's not um, the the additional radiation and everything that's from it. It, it, it was it was going to be so long before they could use the equipment that it didn't really make much sense anyway. Um, and they've actually moved more towards smaller tactical weapons as opposed to the bigger ones. Now, the propaganda and the news and everything likes to talk about the, the 100 megaton weapons and, and the 50 megaton weapons and all that kind of stuff, of which Russia might have one or two. Um, they definitely don't have a lot of them. And those, uh, like especially the Star Bomba, has to be delivered via aircraft. Right, it does. There's, it, they can't fit it on a on an ICBM, so um, <laughs> they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to get a. They don't even really have that many bombers that are capable of flying that distance. To let's be honest, with the performance of their their military, um, so I don't think that those larger weapons are really even a, a concern personally. Um, but the the smaller ones, the 20 megaton and smaller, the, um, you know, really more common is more like 350 kiloton to one megaton. That's going to be way more common than even the 20 megaton stuff. So um, I don't think that neutron bombs are something that you have to worry about. I think they were a concept, they were developed, but then they were never really put into play. So I don't, I don't think from, from my understanding of it, that it's a big thing. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah. I saw those, uh, Hakama Robinson Rashad, he's talking about the Arlo go and the real link go. I saw those that work on Wi-Fi, but that, I, don't, I need something that doesn't work off or excuse me, off of cell phone, but I need something that doesn't work off cell phone either because cell phones aren't going to be working either. So I, I re it really needs to have its own contained Wi-Fi signal and or use a radio data signal or something like that, which is what Wi-Fi really is. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Um So the Lamb of the Light is said, would we see or hear an EMP? Well, no. 
not likely unless and I think Leatherneck Prepper kind of um, kind of answered this. High altitude nuclear blast is going to be detonated very high in the sky, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 350 kilometers up in the atmosphere. Um, it's not likely that you would see it unless you were like within the line of sight and happen to be looking at it. It'd be a, a bright round flash, you know, in the sky, white, real bright white flash. But other than that, if you missed that momentary flash, um, then you're not going to know anything that it, that it happened. And the EM, the EMP as it comes across, you're not going to notice either. As a human, it's not going to interact with you or bother you in any way. Um, but all the stuff around you is going to stop working. So, okay. Um, <laughs> leather neck prepper. It's such a dork. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, the Big Lebowski says, question, how do we deal with an EMP while living in the scorching heat of summer? It's a great question. Uh, honestly, I mean, what, what is your, what is your capacity to deal with heat? <laughs> um, you know, do you have a, uh, stock tank out back to go dip in, you know, <laughs> do you have a portable air conditioner? Uh, I don't know. I mean, these are, these are great questions. And I was talking about this on the live stream the other night. Um, I, in, in a long-term grid down situation, which an EMP wouldn't actually be that long. It probably only be six months or so maybe even less, um, in a long enough term on a long enough timeline in a bad enough crisis, you, I think you'd see a mass migration from the North to the South. And then from, uh, and then from the kind of parts of the, the dry Southwest out towards the West coast and then movement towards the, the Southeast and the East coasts as well. Um, but I mean, that's like an apocalyptic situation. That's probably not going to happen in, realistically in any any uh, time frame. Yes. So if a if a chicken, my understanding is, is if a chicken is irradiated, as as in is is exposed to radiation and or is eating, because that's all they do is scratch and eat, scratch and eat, scratch and eat. Right. So they're going to be eating irradiated particles of dust and everything else and they're going to die probably fairly quickly and so egg production probably isn't going to really be a problem um, but my understanding is is if they did produce any eggs and those eggs would also be infected and you would not want to eat them um uh, let's see I'm about here to wrap this up um okay Brian James says there aren't enough fallout or nuclear bomb shelters. That's correct. That's why you want to get one ready in your basement if you have one ahead of time so that you can you can shelter there. <laughs> uh, Lamb's Light says, so I cut all that plastic for nothing. Well, you can still keep the plastic because if your windows break out, you'll want to seal them up, right? That's good to have. I, I always keep several rolls of plastic here at my house and duct tape just for that. Um, in case the windows go out in a storm or in case uh, I have to cover up a hole in my roof or, you know, like whatever. So it's not a bad idea to have. Uh, Robert Sanders says, uh, what about underground parking garages at apartments? That could be okay if it's, it's like multiple levels down, it'd probably be better. My concern with something with open air like that, where you're getting open air breezes, is that you're going to probably have fallout be blowing into the area. If you were going to shelter in a place like that, you would probably, you'd want to make sure that you could find a room, like maybe an elevator maintenance room, or um, if there's like stairwells that are enclosed in the bottom of it. Some place where you could have an enclosed area that's not going to have a lot of uh, dust penetration. Otherwise, you're going to probably need to um, have some kind of a gas mask or something. And then, you know, multiple filters to go with that. 
It might be a good option for a couple of days just to let the majority of the fallout burn off, so to speak, to, to become less potent for like a couple of days. And then you could like drive home really quickly. Um, but I don't know that I'd want to stay there the whole time, probably. So. Uh, leather on I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not addressing that leather neck prepper. What you should do with your lead paint is you should go eat it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there is an Easter sale going on right now with New Aqua. That's what the website says. Yeah. So I don't know if they'll give you a double uh, discount or not, but the the reality survival discount code, it's good. It's 50 bucks. So it's a pretty good one. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Peter Lametta says, what about using vinyl plank and four foot boxes? They are very heavy, uh, three inches high, build a wall five inches high by two boxes side by side. Yeah, I mean, um, it really, it's it's anything that you can put between you and the fallout. It doesn't matter what the mass is. Make it as heavy and dense as possible and as much of it as you have. Like I talked about earlier, for me, one of the things that I have that I could that I could easily access fairly quickly is bags of wood pellets. And just because I have them right outside the, the house, I, I got some of them even downstairs. And I would I would bring as many of those in as I could, as quickly as I could. And then I would take them down and I would line them up around the top part of my shelves that I built that's closest to the ground level where the fallout would be collecting. Right. Because I don't need I don't need all the mass to be down low in the in in the bottom of the basement because that's a long ways from where the fallout is in a direct line. Um, it's it's the you want as much mass in between you and that item or the, the fallout as you can get. So uh, there you go. That's that's kind of just my thoughts on it. Yeah. Kitty litter. Any any anything. Any mass, it doesn't make any difference. You, uh, just as long as it's heavy and it's dense, it's going to slow it down. You got to think what what gamma radiation is. Is it's a photon of energy that's ex that's moving extremely fast. It's tiny. It's very very small. One photon, and it's pass. It'll pass through a lot of stuff unless it hits a lot of molecules. Um, and so the denser the item, the better and the heavier the better um water is not necessarily great because i think you need like three feet of water uh to have it you know to half the strength of it so um it's items like concrete dirt steel gravel sand you know wood you know, th those things are all going to be better like in in in, in decreasing order kind of so anyway uh there you go for that all right i think that is it guys i'm not sure how long we've been going here but uh, i think that wraps it up um got anything else then put them in the comments below and i'll try to answer them uh one last question here leatherneck prepper says seriously though what about crawl space okay so crawl spaces are tough it, it depends on how they're laid out, right? A lot of crawl spaces, what you'll have is like two, a two foot or so around the exterior of the house that's built up with like concrete and bricks, you know, as your like foundation. And then it'll be like dug out kind of underneath there, maybe another foot and a half or two foot down or something. It's probably not giving you a whole lot of protection. Now, would it be better to be down there than it would be to be up in your house with, you know, nothing protecting you? Yeah, it'd probably be better to be down in there. 
if you had the capacity to be able to dig out a deeper hole in the middle of the uh, crawl space, like where you could like sleep or a place to sit, almost like a DFP, like a defensive fighting position. I'll speak Marine for you. So you know what I'm talking about there, Leatherneck. Um, <laughs> then that would probably be a better option, you know, um, but as far as like most crawl spaces that I have seen, the way that builders leave them is not going to provide you a really good, really good shelter option. But if you went into the center of that crawl space, like not close to any walls, not close to any pillars or foundation mounts, you know, where you had it, find the biggest open area that you could and dig like a, a three or four foot deep DFP um, foxhole then that would provide you pretty good protection. It's going to be kind of crappy living down there for a couple of weeks, but you know, you probably wouldn't die of, uh, of radiation poison <laughs> later or cancer or whatever. Okay. There you go. That's that. Thanks for watching folks. Um, as always, don't forget to live six P's proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Stay safe.